welcome. Uh, thank you for being here for uh, our youth uh, scorebook and training uh, timer train. Uh, we're just going to quickly go over some of the different aspects of the uh, uh, of what it what it means to be on the 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 book, as well as uh, working at the table and and uh, doing the timing. So I guess the first thing I would I would say is thank you to each of you for that are um, watching this from going from the sideline on one side to the opposite sideline. Um, it, uh, so it takes a lot of courage sometimes for our kids to get out on the field. And I would say it takes a lot of courage at times for our adults to go from just being a fan uh, to over on the, on the, the working side of the, of the field, uh, which I personally think is more fun. Uh, it makes the game more enjoyable. Uh, but here we go. Uh, as we as we get started, I guess we're gonna, I just want to do some overview things. Uh, these are some of the rules that we had in place uh, stemming back from last year. And our COVID rules uh, keep changing. If you've been paying attention to the news, you'll see things are going to change here in the state. Uh, and we're waiting for the county to make sure that that happens. So the long and the short is we're still um, – need that we're going by the house rules or whatever the rules are that at any one field, uh, what they're playing by. So it may be as simple as just two people, like they're in the basic with a timer and somebody on the book. It may be having um, a, a third person as a, as a spotter working, or it may be, you know, a spotter in a book and a timer um, for, you know, the home and the visiting fans, or I'm sorry, the home and the visiting teams. Just please keep in mind that, you know, it's good to communicate um, ahead of time uh, what those expectations are. So if you're traveling out to a, a game site, uh, maybe ask ahead of time, hey, what, uh, what are our restrictions or do we have any? And I would say the same goes for masks. Uh, some, some fields may still require masks for people that are working in close proximity to each other. Some may not. So that's just going to be one thing you're going to have to clarify as you go along uh at uh each game uh the thing is you know things if you're going to use tents or canopies to cover a table please make sure you have enough for everybody um and that should be that um basic equipment that you're going to need uh for the home team uh table and chairs some sort of game clock and penalty clock and that can be a cell phone tablet stopwatch kitchen timer anything that helps you keep track of the time. Uh, scorebook, uh, if you're not using a tablet, if you're not using the electronic version, always good to have as a backup, just in case that battery runs out. Something uh, to keep those items dry, whether that be a canopy, a large plastic bag, um, dry bags, anything like that to keep that equipment dry. And of course, extra some extra things that aren't, that are helpful, but not required. Uh, portable scoreboard, a uh, way to keep that scoreboard attached to the table if it's windy. A roll of some athletic tape, extra pens, pencils, sharpies, uh, sharpeners for those pencils, uh, and a horn to indicate the end of the time, um, end of the period, or end of the game, or halftime, or whatever. Uh, some other basics in terms of do's and don'ts while you're working at the table. Uh, I would encourage you to do these do's. Ask the team to uh, stay behind the line. Those, those kids get excited about the idea of playing and they just kind of creep towards uh, creep towards the fields and they creep towards those uh, substitution boxes and it makes it hard to see. Please feel free to ask them to move back so that you can see and make sure that you can see the full field uh, without much trouble. Uh, feel free to ask a referee to repeat a call. Uh, nothing wrong with that. And then ask that player that happens to be in the penalty box that they can kneel down so you still have good sight lines. Some of these don'ts, uh, some of these are harder than others. Um, uh, cheering, you know, we're parents. We're out there. We've got our kids out playing. You know, we want to see them do well. I'm not, I wouldn't say that you can't say good job, Johnny, but we don't want to be, we can't be vocal like we are on the opposite side of the field. Um, that's a distraction. Um, 
uh, not only for the others at the table, but th for those um, on either side of the, uh, either team uh, can be a distraction for them. Uh, getting in a yelling match with coaches, saying rude things to players or coaches and being respectful, disrespectful towards the officials. Um, many times these, the officials that we have doing those youth games are in their first or second year and they're high school kids that are, you know, trying to give back to the game. Uh, like we encourage a lot of our kids to do. And, uh, you know, they're new to the officiating thing and parents, definitely older adults have a definite, um, advantage in terms of a power dynamic. So even though many times they're paired up with an adult, that's not always the case. So please be respectful of those officials um, and ask them if you need clarification on anything uh, during the middle of a play or during the game is not uh, the time to have an argument or a lengthy discussion with our officials. Uh, as you look at the, this is the map or the layout of a field for the five, six and the seven, eight. Um, you'll see that the substitution area that's down towards the bottom of the screen, you'll see the table area with the coaches area and there's a substitution area that's right in front of your table. Uh, the team benches are positioned on either side of that uh, on the sideline. And the scores, type, the scores table is gonna be right there in the middle, right at midfield. Um, uh, what's important and what we want to try to do is spectators uh, as best we can should be on the opposite side of the field. Uh, that doesn't always work, but that's the ideal situation. If they're not, then we need to keep them back, um, you know, a fair distance from the players or in the bleachers or something like that, depending on how your field is situated. Uh, as, it, as it points out here, uh, having uh, spectators at the end lines or on the ends of the field. Uh, I'm gonna let you figure out why that's not a good one, but we just don't want anybody getting hit with that projectile. As you can see again, right here, you're right in the middle of the action. Uh, it's a great place to see the game. It's a great place to be involved. Um, and this is where you wanna be. Uh, the uh, officials will let you know how close, we say about six yards off the, off the field. Sometimes that's possible, sometimes that's not. Uh, but we want to make sure that we try to keep um, you safe as uh, as well, because uh, as as we all know, not all of these kids have uh, mastered uh, the throwing and the catching portion of the game, and we want to try to keep you safe and not getting you hit by one of those balls that comes inadvertently flying out um, towards the uh, scores table. Uh, for the three four fields. Uh, just, you know, you can see the representation here. They're just going to be turned the opposite way. So we can get two uh, fields on what would be considered a uh, normal lacrosse field for our five, six, or our seven, eights. Uh, so you're just going to need to um, set up your timing area, that type of thing, uh, right at, at midfield uh, on those. Um, again, just trying to stay off the, stay off the line a little bit if you can. But knowing that um, those uh, those smaller fields uh, make for some fun action, it's a little bit uh, a little bit uh, quicker game, as uh, it will be a running time, and we'll get into the time parameters and that type of thing in just a moment. Uh, what I want to try to do is break things up a little bit in terms of how it looks for the uh, responsibilities for the timer and those of the scorekeeper. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just kind of run through what it looks like for the timer, see if there's any questions. We'll go through the scorekeepers um, section, see if there's any questions. Uh, we'll talk a little about statistics and then uh, we'll take any additional questions that people might have right at the end. So let's get started. Uh, Pre-game setup in terms of being a timer. Um, please make sure that you get there in enough time that you can uh, test your clocks and timers. Uh, again, I would always make sure that you've got a uh, backup just in case. Uh, you're gonna wanna request um, some game balls from your coach and please feel free to introduce yourself uh, to the officials. Knowing that some officials uh, 
will be maybe arriving, coming from one game or go, leaving one game and going to another. They may arrive just shortly before the game begins. Uh, please take that couple of minutes uh, or that 30 seconds to introduce yourself and ask some clarifying questions, such as uh, who's timing the timeouts and who's doing halftime. Uh, important things. Some officials will take that upon themselves uh, just to keep the game moving. Some officials will ask the timer to take care of that. Just make sure you guys are on the same page as far as that goes. Uh, and ask uh, what time they want you to yell out, you know, different uh, time increments. It might be two minutes uh, for the periods. Uh, it might be, they might actually want an, an additional one at 30 seconds. Uh, that might vary from official to official, but two minutes uh, at the end of uh, the second at the second period uh, or going into halftime and at the end of the game are pretty standard. In terms of scorebook uh, for the scores, let's make sure that we got the names and the rosters home and away, um, and we need to indicate who the in-home player is. Uh, and it's the player who will serve any penalties that are called on the bench. So it's listed as the first attack person on the roster. So that'll make sense uh, when we see that book in just a few minutes. So game clock uh, for the five, six, and the seven, eights. Uh, in the gel, we're gonna play four 10 minute quarters that are stop time. Simply means anytime the whistle blows uh, and the official indicates that they're gonna, with the a rotating motion of their arm. We're going to start the clock anytime they wave their hands over the head. We're going to stop it, uh, just like you would see in uh, basketball, for example. Um, in terms of our breaks, we're going to have two minute breaks between quarters, five minutes at half, and there'll be two timeouts per half. In the event that we are tied at the end of regulation, there is up to two four minute sudden victory uh, overtime periods, uh, which simply means that uh, should somebody score a goal a minute and a half into the, into the overtime period, that uh, goal counts, game is then over. So we're not gonna play out the, the extra, uh, extra time like you may have seen like in a soccer match, for example. Uh, one, in those time at, or in that overtime period, we're going to have one timeout per team, and again, no more than two overtime periods uh, for five, six, and seven, eight. One thing that's uh, new as of last year that is really important to be a, uh, and is going to require you to be paying attention is the quick start um, the, or the quick restarts that are now part of the game. So. Uh, when that happens, they don't necessarily have to wait for the officials um, to signal that we're gonna start. They can grab the ball um, and restart themselves. Uh, so please, the, the officials should make a, an emotion to you know, start the clock uh, when that happens. So please be paying attention um, and uh, watching it. Just because the ball goes out of bounds doesn't mean that you have 30 seconds before the, before the game restarts. It may be restarting in just a matter of moments. At the three, four level, um, 20 minute running halves. Uh, and then we're gonna have a five to 10 minute halftime. I would suggest having a quick discussion with the coaches um, before the game uh, about that. Uh, sometimes weather or um, other uh, factors, maybe you got a late start and you only have the field for a certain amount of time may limit uh, or put a restriction on how much halftime can be. So just something to be aware of. Hey, Mike, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, you said the four 10 minutes with stop time. What, what criteria is the stop time? Uh, in terms of, uh, so for example, the ball or they, uh, there's a face off, the clock starts, the team A, works the ball down the field, they score a goal. Uh, at that point in time, the clock stops. So pretty much any time the referee stops, it, there's a stop play for whatever reason. Goal scores, exactly. ball goes out, he stops it for an injury or whatever. Those are all things that... It, exactly. 
Okay. Exactly. At what point is it not a stop time game? Isn't there a point differential that you would let the clock run out? What a great segue. Yes, there is. Oh, um, <laughs> again, and the three, four games, all of them are running time. But at the five, six and the seven, eight, when we get to 12 goals, when there's a 12 goal differential in the second half, uh, then it becomes a, stop, or a running clock situation. Um, game and uh, the uh, game and the penalty clock uh, also stops if there's a timeout during a running time. So you've your team is up by 12, and now they're up by 13, and the opposing team calls a timeout, the clock stops, just to be clear. And if there was a penalty happening at the same time, that, that clock would stop as well. Does that answer your question, Melanie? It does, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, as the timer, you're also responsible for penalties. Um, and you're responsible to keep track of uh, what time the penalty, um, when the penalty starts, but more importantly, when the penalty is released. Now, does it matter? Um, it matters a little bit to you what kind of penalty it is, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, for technical fouls, they serve um, 30 seconds. For personal fouls, they can serve one, two, or three minutes. So. Um, if you're not sure what kind of foul it was or what the, exactly the call was, again, ask the official and ask them um, what kind of foul that was so we make sure that we just get it correct. Um, the penalty, as I mentioned, the penalty time runs with the game time. So if the game time stops for a, for a moment or two, the, um, the game clock stops, the penalty time stops. Um, I've seen in my experience, points when this has gotten confusing for people um, or penalties weren't done correctly, just know that if one clock stops, the second one stops. Um, <coughs> um, at the end of, or when a, there is a penalty, I should say, uh, the, uh, per, the, the player serving that penalty should come to the penalty box be inside the penalty box and kneel down in front of the table so that you can't see if that's where they need to serve that penalty. Um, so as, as it says here, you know, penalty time is regulated by the timer. If it's a 30 second time or a 30 second penalty, uh, we're gonna get to 10 seconds. You'll probably announce 10 seconds and then start a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way down to three, two, one, and release. Release is the key word. Release is what the kids are, are listening for. Um, and that means that they can then leave the penalty box. They have served their penalty. Um, are they gonna go out on the field? Maybe. Are they gonna go back to their bench? Perhaps. Um, people can substitute on that if they want to, or the kid can, or the player could be released back to the game of play. That's a coach's decision, but nothing can happen until you say release. So please make sure that you're saying it loudly um, so that they can uh, hear that. If you've got a, a situation where it's a longer penalty, maybe it's a two minute penalty that somebody served, probably giving a 30 second warning is not a bad, uh, a bad uh, thing to do. And then again, with 10 seconds left, um, we wanna start the countdown. If there is a substitute that's coming into the penalty box with 10 seconds left, that person can enter the box. Um, so perhaps they're going to be a defensive substitution. They may go to the far side of the penalty box on release. They, when you say release, the child or the player serving the penalty goes back to the bench and the defensive player who's uh, now coming on can be, come on from the far end of the box. Um, as I said, the countdown is a verbal cue for many players uh, to get ready to leave the box or to uh, be getting prepared to go back into play. The other thing to, I guess to know, uh, I think is important is that all penalties are releasable unless the official lets you know otherwise. So if they make the, you see the signal on the side of the screen here with the, the official with his hands 
directly over his head with his palms together, that indicates a non-releasable penalty. We'll get to that in just a second. But what releasable, what a releasable penalty means simply is that um, the team is shorthanded. Uh, the team with the advantage scores a um, scores a goal that might be 10 seconds into the penalty, that might be 25 seconds into the penalty. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the penalty time has been served and people are released from the penalty box. Uh, if there's more than one player in the box at, the, at any time and they all have releasable penalties, then they're all released at that time. A non-releasable penalty simply means that if the player, um, whatever the, the infraction was that's non-releasable, the player cannot leave the penalty box until their full penalty time is served. So the team with the um, advantage may have a full two minute advantage um, and can score as many goals as they can with the penalized team being shorthanded. So that's the real difference uh, between a, re a releasable and a non-releasable penalty. Is that clear? Because that's an important one as far as the timer to make sure that you know that that's a non-releasable they need to um, serve that full time. Okay. Um, in terms of other things uh, regarding the penalty, if a pen, if a player receives four personal fouls or five minutes of penalty, um, five minutes worth of personal fouls, so maybe they've accumulated five minutes over three personal fouls, uh, they're done for the day. Um, I need to let the referee know this uh, when this happens. Um, and my guess and my hope would be that this is something you're going to be um, talking with the person who's doing the score uh, keeping as well, because they'll have a record of this in the book. Uh, so you so you know, uh, but this is just a good conversation or a good checkpoint between the two, uh, the two of you, the, the scorekeeper and the timer. Uh, only three people, three players from the um, one team in the penalty box at a time. The fourth, if, should you get to a situation where there's a fourth, uh, they're just going to need to wait their turn. Um, and on any stoppage of play during a penalty, be prepared to be asked uh, how much time's left in the penalty, whether that's the player who turns around and asks you that, or it's a coach. The 30 second penalties um, go fairly quickly. Uh, so rarely will you get asked that, but you might. Um, and the other thing I guess to point out, um, I guess, let me, two thoughts is, you uh, most often will get asked this on a longer serving penalty. So a minute, two minutes, you know, how much, how much time do they have? How much time do they have uh, on any stoppage of play? The other thing to keep in mind is that if a quarter ends or a period ends and there's still time remaining on the penalty, it does carry over into the next period. So a 30 second penalty, 30 second penalty gets called with 15 seconds left to go in period three. Uh, the team with the advantage does not score uh, and uh, the period ends. Uh, the team that had the advantage will start with the, an advantage for another 15 seconds uh, or unless they score a goal. So just know that those do carry over from one period to the next. Um, in terms of penalties, if you are in a situation where um, you do have a running clock, uh, in the second half, for example, you get one and a half times the normal um, amount. So a 30 second, as you see the examples here, a 30 second penalty becomes 45, a 60 second penalty becomes 90 seconds. Again, penalties start um, on the whistle and they stop for timeouts. So um, just because the person has gone in the box and the, and the penalty time or the clock is still running, until the ball is put back into play and the referee indicates that the um, play is resumed, that's when the penalty time resumes on a running clock.
Mike, can I ask a question really quick? On hold. Um, oh my gosh, I totally forgot what I was just about to say. Oh, why is it that it's only a running clock in the second half? Um, You're talking a second half of the game, so like the third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. That's just one of the rules that we have in the gel. Okay. Um, perhaps when we get to the end, maybe Bernie can, can jump in and uh, answer that question for us. Okay. Thank you. All right, scorekeeper, uh, your job uh, is to make sure that we keep track of the score. Uh, we, um, so we know what the running total is on the score. We know who scored the goals, um, any penalties, uh, who's received them and when that happened, as well as timeouts for each team. Those are the basic things that we need in terms of the game. We'll get to the stats in a minute, um, but those aren't required uh, to have to have a game. These are the, uh, the basics that we need for each game. So simply, uh, if you look at a scorebook, if you're forced to go uh, to the old to the paper route and you're not using a uh, tablet or something like that or a scoring program, the top of the page, there's you know a place for each team. And this is a place where you can keep track of the goals as well as the assists and the time and that type of thing. So that's, this is where the, you put the, the teams in. Um, and then what you're gonna do is after each goal, uh, you wanna document uh, the time in the quarter, uh, the player scoring the goal, and if there was assist, who assisted in the goal. And we'll get to we'll get we'll break down what a goal is. We'll break down what an assist is in just a, just a minute. So every time you see a little block like this, we know that the one goal has been scored, and subsequent goals after that. Okay, the roster, which is the next thing that um, is in the book. Um, this is where you're going to list all your players. Again, that first attack person, whoever's listed there, is the in-home person. Um, and it's going to be the one who's going to serve any bench penalties uh, that may occur. Uh, if you can, let's try to have this uh, done 15 to 20 minutes before the game. Not always doable. Uh, you may only get the book from the coach <laughs> 10 minutes beforehand. But it's important to make sure that it is uh, ready and accurate uh, to go beforehand. Uh, if, you if you are in a situation where you have somebody who's going to be a visiting scorekeeper, you're going to want to share. Uh, share that information and, and get each other's rosters in. Some people like to figure out, get an Excel spreadsheet and they will create a um, template that matches a scorebook and they'll just come with that ready to go and they'll hand it to you and you can just tape it right into your book um, and then you're ready to go. So that's one time-saving thing that you can do uh, ahead of time. Uh, I find that uh, the teams that I've seen that do that and somebody doesn't show up for a game uh, or is, isn't going to be available that week and they just cross them off the list, um, then that seems to work pretty well. Uh, here's the area that we're going to use for penalties on the scorebook. So if there's a penalty, uh, you're going to record the time that it occurred, the player number, uh, what the penalty was, uh, what time of the game it occurred and the game time. Uh, and when I, the time uh, at the first one should be like 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. So we'll see that. So here, if you look, you'll see that the first, the first one, it was a 30 second penalty on number 17 for holding in the first quarter at 211. And the second penalty uh, was a one minute penalty on number 25 for tripping in the first quarter at the 8.30 mark, so on and so forth. And this is all gonna be on uh, for one team. This won't be for both teams. Um, it will be handled, uh, one side, one page will be just for the home team, one side will be just for the visiting team. Timeouts, again, game time, which quarter it was, whoops. Um, so that you can uh, 
put those in um, just so you know when those occurred. <coughs> Questions on that to this point? Okay, so here's some stats that you can take um, and uh, you'll need to talk to your coach to see which stats they want uh, recorded, and then you'll do your best that you can. And having all of these things, having these, trying to get these stats is where you want a spotter. Um, it becomes really helpful. So shots um, is defined by as an offensive player who propels the ball towards a goal with the intent to score. Um, again, this this is subjective, but um, it's one of those things that uh, it becomes, after you've seen enough lac lacrosse, it becomes apparent when it's a shot and when it's not. Uh, if it's, uh, uh, the kid winds up and it looks like they're going for goal, uh, it's a shot. If it's a lollygagging pass, maybe to behind the goal, uh, that doesn't count. It'll become, it'll become pretty apparent. Um, and then again, let the referee decide if, uh, if the ball has gone out of bounds. Uh, sometimes we get confused on that, but they'll definitely make a signal to indicate that that has happened. Um, a goal, simply the ball is, um, a goal always has a shot, but uh, it's been propelled by the offensive player into the goal. You'll see the, the official raises hands, both hands up over his head. Um, and that's the, at that point in time, the clock is going to stop uh, unless it's a running clock. But if what you want to do is notate the time of the goal. So, for example, a goal has been scored and uh, you, the scorekeeper will start to make a notation of it. And the timer hopefully will call out 837 and then the, time, the scorekeeper will write that into the book. Uh, we'll see that it was number three that scored it and an assist, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, will be given to number 27. And those will go into that score line. And then we can fill in the other portions of the score of the um, scorebook in just a moment. Uh, keep in mind that a defensive player can't score or can't create an own goal if they do. Um, the closest offensive player gets credit for the goal. Uh, if you, it looks like it was a goal, but you're not sure, just make sure that you're checking, uh, what, looking at the official. Uh, sometimes the ball goes in and out very quickly. Um, and sometimes it looks like things have happened and it actually is sitting on the outside of the, outside of the uh, frame and the back of the net as opposed to being inside. So here's our, <coughs> pardon me, here's our score sheet. There was a goal by the blue team at 810. Scored by number two, um, and it was unassisted. So Mr. Cherry is going to get a shot on goal. He's going to get a goal. And in the shots section over there on statistics, we're going to make a tick mark as well. And these, these uh, lines that we're making under goals uh, or shots, assist, goals, assists, that type of thing, um, is simply just a tick mark. That's, that's all that's needed, uh, so you can add them up later. So an assist, um, again, this becomes a, a judgment call, but it's direct pass um, to a teammate who scores without dodging a vague point more, uh, dodging a point other than to the goalie in the crease. They can take a few steps. It can be a ball that comes from behind the goal. They catch it out front. They make one or two moves, they score. I would count that as an assist. If um, the defender, the uh, player with the long pull intercepts a pass, they throw it up to a midfielder. The midfielder then throws it up to an attackman. The attackman throws it to another attackman. And then the uh, uh, attackman, the first attackman gets it back and scores. The defender does not get an assist. <laughs> Uh, but the second attackman may get an assist because they played the ball back and forth. Um, again, you'll once you see it, you'll get used to it, um, and you can decide amongst the table whether that was an assist or not. Um, how many how many steps did that offensive player need to make 
uh, to make uh, um, to make a uh, goal. If they get get the ball from the defender at half field or at midfield, and then that midfielder runs, you know, through four or five players, um, goes around the goal, comes back out from behind the goal, and then scores. That's unassisted. The defender, the defenseman does not get a, I, in my judgment, probably would not get a, an assist for that. So now we've got the blue team who's going to get, uh, they're going to score. They, get, they got a goal at the 630 mark, uh, scored by number three with the assist by number two. So number three uh, gets, gets the shot. He gets a goal. Back to Mr. Cherry. Uh, sorry, we switched colors on you here. Uh, he now gets a tick mark in the assist column, and we get another tick mark over in the shots. So, so far, we have two shots and two goals for the blue team here in the first period. Ground balls. Um, this is probably, I think, the, the most confusing thing for people uh, that are learning to keep these statistics. Um, it took me quite a while to kind of figure it out. And I think I finally have a sense for it, but it's when the ball comes um, into the possession of a player under pressure of an opponent with five yards, uh, five yards of the player controls the ball by passing, shooting, or cradling. <coughs> um, so an interception, they knock the ball out of, one player knocks the ball out of another player's stick. It's bouncing on the ground. A second player comes and picks it up. That's a ground ball. Um, the one thing you can't do is you can't be running down the field, drop the ball, it rolls for 10 yards and you scoop it back up. You didn't, you didn't create a ground ball for yourself. Um, it has to um, change possession or there has to be an attempt to have it change possession for there to be a ground ball. Um, as it points out here at the bottom, there's always a ground ball after a face-off, often it'll be referred to as possession. Uh, uh, except if there's an illegal procedure. So if there's something goes awry with a face-off and the team is awarded a um, awarded the ball, um, there's no ground ball for that. Again, this is one that it may be difficult the first game or two that you see it, but you'll get you just kind of get used. To, you know, you'll get used to um, awarding this. And if you're not sure, ask. Ask the others that are around. You think that was a ground ball? Coach, was that a ground ball? <laughs> um, and they'll, they'll help help you uh, with their definition of, of what a ground ball is. Again, this this is a statistics that's for your team only. Uh, so uh, talk with your coach and see what they say about what how they would consider uh, this being a ground ball as well. Okay, here we are. Um, down here, number 18, picked up a ground ball, and we make a tick mark, we give that to number 18, and then a ground ball uh, in the overall team totals up there in the, under statistics for ground balls. So you can start to see how things get filled in pretty, pretty quickly. Um, number nine had a shot. We put another shot uh, tick in the, in the um, statist team statistics box four shots and then you'll see that willow uh, number eight got a ground ball so we'll give them another uh, statistic or tick mark uh, the uh, one stat that the goalies like is saves um, anytime the basically the that the uh, goalie gets in the way whether it's using their stick their body uh, or anything else to keep the ball from going in the goal uh, they get a save. If the only time they don't get a save is that if the ball was not in a threat or did not have the ability to go in the goal, um, it's not a save. It's just like if it was a shot or not. If it's ten feet over the over the goal, the intention may have been a shot, but uh, there's definitely not a save because there was no way it was going in. And the goalies have their own little section. Um, down here on the score in the scorebook as well. Um, and you'll notice that it's got three lines because you may be rotating goalies. So you can definitely add shots uh, and 
the goalies like that see those statistics. I do know that. If you want to tra keep track of faceoffs, uh, who won them and who didn't, uh, again, talk to your coach uh, about whether that's something you want to keep track of. You can see that if you start keeping all these statistics as a scorekeeper, you're going to be uh, looking at your book quite a bit, indicating um, where all these things go. Uh, and uh, so, uh, if you decide that you're going to do more than just the, the basics, uh, having a spotter or maybe even having two is very helpful. So things to keep in mind are here's some tips. Um, as I, we talked about some of them before, but here I want to just reemphasize, keep a spare timer with you. Um, and that may be just a phone. Just make sure that your phone's got, you know, you know how to uh, find that timer app. Uh, if you are going to use your phone, please make sure that you've got extra batteries. Um, or you've got a battery pack so it doesn't run out of juice. Uh, bring tape, athletic duct tape, band-aids, or a fall first small uh, or a small first aid kit. Uh, even though most of our coaches and our programs have first aid kits, uh, it's surprising to me how many times I've had people come to the table to ask for those things because they can't seem to find them or that they're out of whatever that particular item is that they're they need. Um, have something to hold down that if you're using a flip scoreboard, have something to down, hold it down in the event that it's uh, windy or maybe even rainy. Um, that never seems to happen during lacrosse season, of course, that uh, we have wind and rain. Uh, but just in the event that that happens, you just want to be prepared. Some people like to use multicolored pencils or pens. Nothing wrong with that. Um, as I mentioned before, you can pre-type the roster. Uh, for your opponent's uh, scorebook, if you um, want to do that, not a problem. Always appreciate it. That makes that um, makes everything legible uh, and much easier to find um, who each player is uh, on any given team. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Again, um, just know that coaches are going to ask for time remaining on the uh, penalties. Uh, and, how, and even potentially how much time's left in a quarter. Uh, at my school, we're fortunate we have a clock that's actually vi people can see, uh, so they can oftentimes look for it themselves. But uh, in many of the fields we play at, we don't have that uh, that luxury. So uh, please make sure that you're uh, yelling out, you know, two minutes left, uh, and uh, letting coaches know or the referees know how much time's left in any given period or how much time's left in the penalty. Uh, I'll demonstrate here in just a moment slash marks or heavy lines on the score line to indicate quarters. Um, it's definitely helpful uh, to quickly look and know it was two to, th two to one at the end of the first quarter. And at halftime or the end of period two, it was five to three. Um, it'll... Um, I'll show you that and I think it'll make sense uh, real quick. Extra pencils and a pencil sharpener, uh, batteries for a clock, timer, tablet, or phone. Um, and remember, if you make a mistake, it's okay. Um, we're all gonna make mistakes, that's how we learn. And um, if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, again, whether it be your coach on a rule, um, on maybe who a player was, maybe that scored a goal, um, the official, you know, who did you have scoring that goal? What was the number on that penalty? Was that a 30 second penalty? Was that a minute penalty? Is that releasable? Is that non-releasable? How long, how long did you want for timeouts or uh, for the uh, halftime? Uh, and you're keeping track of the timeouts uh, official? Yeah, okay, great. Um, and, if you know what you don't, if you forget to start the, you're in charge of the timeouts and you forget to start the clock, um, you won't you won't do it. Probably, you know, you might do it again, but it's not the end of the world. So, uh, just do your best, um, and uh, you know, try to enjoy the fact that you're uh, you get to see a part of the game that not everybody gets to see uh, from the other sideline. So. There's those tick marks. Um, so here's an actual um, scorebook. Uh, this was from, a, uh, I believe, a high school game, actually. But you'll see those red tick marks. 
indicate that at the end of the first period, it was two to one. And at the end of the second period, it was, looks like one, two, three, five, probably five to one, or maybe five to two. Uh, if you look at that Redmond, that second line, it's a little bit darker after that second goal. But at the end, uh, it was 10-4. So perhaps there wasn't a, a goal scored in the third period and they were all scored in the fourth period. Um, and maybe you wanna make a, a second double line if that's the case. Um, it's only a suggestion. It's not a have to, um, but it's, uh, if you want to keep track of how the scoring went uh, quarter by quarter, that's a simple way to do it. But again, as you look down at some of the different things, you will see that, for example, if you look at uh, the attack number six, uh, Mr. Anderson, he played, we know he played three quarters. He had two shots, a goal, an assist, and two ground balls. And you'll see that uh, there was a total of three penalties during that game. Uh, one against number four in the first, uh, that was one minute for slashing in the first quarter at the 9.50 mark. And if you look even a little further to the right, you'll see the ground balls. And then you'll see the shots. They had 37 total shots and 41 total ground balls. Again, it becomes a question when you get to the statistics, that's a question of what your coach and your team wants to keep track of. The most important are the goals. Um, goals and when it happened, what time it happened, and <coughs> pardon me, and the uh, penalties uh, for the for each team. Uh, here's just an example of what it looks like if you uh, want to do a pre-printed uh, statistical sheet for the uh, for a book. But some will just take the name and the numbers and allow you to post them into like where it says the home team. And you'll just have them separated by attack and middies and defensemen. So you can you can approach it any way you like. There's no uh, preferred or exact way that you have to do it. Some other resources or things that you might see um, some uh, some simple scorebook apps or timing apps um, that are listed here. Um, again, this is just a sample and I'm not endorsing any of these. Uh, I will tell you I've had um, experience with uh, LAX time and score uh, as well as uh, LAX keeper uh, in terms of timing games. Uh, and those seem to work pretty well. They're real simple. They just keep track of a score and a time and penalty minutes. So if you're looking for something to do just those three things, um, that that will work. Um, the, I've heard of other people who've tried Scorebook Plus and iScore and they seem to like it. It's just a matter of whether it makes sense to you. So is it something you have to use? No, um, but you're welcome to try it. Um, uh, other things I'd point out, um, the GEL website is a good resource for things. And in the document section, there's a link here to the rules matrix that uh, has all the different rules um, per level that are important uh, things you need to know. It'll go over like how much time do we put, you know, I can't remember, was that 10 minutes? Was that eight minutes? Was that 12 minutes? I don't remember how much time it was that we, how many along those periods are. That kind of information is in that rules matrix. Uh, the other thing that I would, encourage you to do if you have a question about rules or anything like that is uh, the uh, USA Lacrosse. The, um, uh, you can get the rules book for the youth, uh, for the boys youth. And at the end of that, or towards the end of that, pages 84 through 88, it has the signals that the officials will use um, during the game. Um, and I would strongly suggest going and just taking a look at those so you can familiarize yourself with just even some of the basic ones in terms of start the clock, start, stop the clock, uh, what a goal looks like, uh, releasable penalty, non-releasable penalty. Um, and uh, just so that you're, you've hopefully seen it or if you're, you know, they say that's a non-releasable penalty, but they didn't make the signal. Was that truly a non-releasable penalty? I just want to make sure. Or 
I saw you make a signal, but I didn't hear you say it was non-releasable. I want to clarify. Things like that. So please uh, take a look at those um, officials uh, signals. Uh, and I think that will make your job easier as well. Uh, lastly, um, thanks to Katie Larson, who originally did this uh, presentation and put much of the content together. Uh, I've added changed a, a few things, but uh, I want to make sure that she gets credit for um, the work that she's done as well. Whew. That was a lot of information and not, uh, not a lot of time. So I want to see if there's other questions that uh, anybody else had. Shall I answer the first question that's been asked? Sure. Okay. So uh, the question was about um, um, goals, uh, games that have a goal differential of 12 goals and how it switches from um, stop time to running time. Is that correct. The question, correct? Yeah, so the question was about the rationale behind that. So that rule came from uh, the high school uh, rule book and then was adopted by the youth. And so uh, with, with the high school side, it's uh, Article 3-1-2, Article 2. Uh, so after the first any time the score differential reaches 12 or more goals. Oh, you just cut out, Bernie. Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, nope. Okay. You're very faint. All right, let's see here. That's better, perfect. Okay, so any time the score differential reaches 12 goals or more, starting with a whistle resuming play, the clock will only be stopped for a team timeout, an official's timeout, or an injury timeout. In the past, if that score differential reduced to fewer than 12 goals, then normal play would resume. However, that provision has been struck uh, so once the differential reaches 12, then uh, we continue with um, running clock. Uh, and all plays that occur during a differential situation would be running time. Uh, and so the rationale for that um, was that uh, it had been uh, observed that, that games in which that situation occurred can run for more than two hours. And with many programs having um, only one main field, uh, it can result in timing issues with other sports or activities. Um, and so uh, that is why it was adopted at the high school level. And then at the uh, youth level, uh, it was adopted um, to build upon that change. Um, and so that, that is where that came from. And, and to, to add on to that, if you can clarify, Bernie, does that 12 does that twelve goal differential, does that apply only in the second half or is that in the first half as well? Second half. Okay. Yeah, so if it occurs in the first half, it, it has no impact. Um, but once that situation exists in the second half, that is when the transition to running clock would go. Okay. And just to, just to clarify... If it's a 12 goal differential, and then maybe it's, then it goes back under 12, uh, the running clock does not stop. The Correct. The clock continues. We continue yeah. with running clock to the end of the game. Okay. And that's a, I think also a, um, a blowout rule or a sportsmanship rule as well. Yes. Um, we don't want, we don't Mercy want, rule. Yeah. yeah, we don't want it to be 30, you know, 30 to five for example, uh, if we can help it. Yep. Uh, as um, I think uh, one of the other coaches I work with who said, you know, it's our job to play hard and, and be good sports but we all, and to have fun, but we also need to make sure the other team has fun in the sense that nobody likes to lose 30 to 5. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we want people to come back and keep playing lacrosse and having fun. So if we can, what we can do to uh, make that happen uh, that this is one of those things that we can, an adjustment we can make to try to make that happen. 